as most teenagers are, I was pretty reckless with my own safety. I knew about people being taken and people being killed, but I thought I was invincible and doubted anything would ever happen to me. At the same time, I was quite receptive, paranoid, and aware of my surroundings, just not educated enough. Being this naive comes with its fair share of dangerous situations. From ages 12 to 17, I preferred to go out in the dark. It felt more exciting. I would frequently go out for long walks with my best friend, who is a year younger than me. And if I wasn't with her, I'd tell my mom I was, so that she wouldn't worry. We never really had specific destinations, I just loved to walk. And at the latest stages, despite my previous experiences, I would walk town to town, frequenting particular benches or deserted places. Stupid, I know. This experience I shared with my friend when I was around 14, and her 13. One of our regular daytime spots was a well-known area of my town. Hard to miss. Huge chalk hills and woods, with miles of fields and farm. A very strange sight amongst the businesses, homes, council estates, miles of roads and shopping centres surrounding it. As you can imagine, a beautifully quiet place to visit, to get away from the rush and mounds of other humans, and instead watch it from afar. It tended to only be dog walkers and the occasional jogger that frequented these areas, and apart from teenage parties, which were few and far between in this area of the hills, I'd never heard of much crime occurring here. One evening, we walked to a park we liked to chill in. I cringe thinking about this place too. It was huge and fenced in behind lines of houses, and was locked at a certain time each night. It was the most remote and lesser known park in an area that had many of a similar size, mostly due to being hard to find and it held an even lesser known passage to the hills. We hung around in the park for a bit in the darkness of winter, got bored and decided that we would go for a stroll across the fields, maybe even try to get into our little den that we had built there one summer, for some much desired adrenaline. From past experiences going with groups, there were rarely ever people there after dark. Probably because it wasn't very well lit. We took the path and joked around on the field under the hills, wandering around, when we noticed a short, stocky man with a limp in the distance. I instantly got a strange feeling about him, and it wasn't my usual fight-or-flight anxiety I got with your regular human. It was pure, get your little ass down that path and to somewhere safe, anxiety. He seemed to stop and turn around and walk a bit, and then turn back towards us and walk a bit closer, then change his mind over and over, and then he stopped again and turned towards us, and as if on a mission, headed in our direction. We headed straight for the path. We started slow, nervously giggling, and looked behind ourselves, and realised this man was really gaining, despite his limp. It just didn't feel right at this point, so we ran. We ran through the unlit park, which at this point had a multitude of bats flying across, just to add to the allure of it, and we looked behind us. He was still following. When we were at the gate exiting, he just started to cross the grass. Now this wasn't the only way to the main road. It was muddy and dark and occasionally locked, but in our worry I don't even think that crossed our minds. Looking back, most rational thinking adults 
probably wouldn't go this way behind two little girls. They'd follow the path that went around the outside one instead. We went this way, because to us it seemed the quickest, and already in an unsafe situation. It didn't seem as dangerous as this stranger catching up. We ran down the road, crossed the traffic lights and slowed down. We were next to a pub so we felt safe. We rationalized it. I mean, it could be a coincidence, as he was just walking in the same direction as us. But at the same time, we still wanted to get home without him knowing where we lived. So we continued forward at a fair pace. Again looking back as we walked, this man was still staggering after us, and he looked tired. Why didn't he slow down or stop? Nothing added up. We were down a dark empty road, and were unnerved once again. It was about three quarters of a mile until we got to some 24 hour shop, so we decided we would run it. The sooner we were around with other people, the better. We just about made it to a shop, hid behind a passport photo machine, and looked towards the road where we'd left the man behind. In these few seconds, I felt rational again, and imagined that he would just continue his rushed walk all the way to his home. But instead, he stopped at the crossing and inspected the roads. He was looking for us, and looked every way we could have gone. He was searching for something, and it certainly wasn't a car. He decided on a street, and as fast as he could drag his dodgy leg, he attempted to trail after us. Me and my mate were shaken. We couldn't understand why he was following us, but we knew that he almost certainly was. After a few minutes, we decided to try and confirm what was happening and peeked down the road he went down. We could see him clearly annoyed, looking down each side road and turning in circles, desperately looking for a sign of where we went. We left him there, and hurried home in the opposite direction, only taking the main roads. The next day at school, we told the story to our friends at lunchtime, and everyone agreed it was weird. He must have followed us at least one and a half miles in the end, which was a long distance. Just for comical value, although reasonably irrelevant, I'll add that just as lunch ended, a janitor with a strikingly similar limp and of same body type walked into the cafeteria. Myself and my friends just looked at each other and for a short while convinced ourselves that it was him. We still talk about it now, and wonder what his intentions were. I wonder more about what he would have done if he had caught up to us at the shops or pub. I most likely now think he was just trying to scare us, either because that made him feel something, or because he wanted us to not endanger ourselves like that again. But I think that just might be my naivety shining through. I can't say I was a lot more careful after that experience, but I am glad to still be here, and much more educated and aware now. All I can say is, I never went back to those hills after dark, and wouldn't recommend it, either. I live surrounded by the forest, about a mile away from a haunted lake. I have recurring and painfully vivid nightmares of what I always assume are wendigos and skimwalkers, staring into my window or coming out of the woods or coming into my home, almost weekly. Prior to these, I haven't had any nightmares since I was perhaps seven or eight. I never ever knew of the idea of humanoids before these nightmares began. They're actually the reason I've been researching everything the past few months. I've heard some creepy stuff at night as well, 
notably when I'm outside in my hot tub at around 1-3am, to 3 AM, and can hear large branches snapping closer and closer to my house, and scuffled steps. I always assumed it was an animal, but now I'm not so sure. July 13th, 2017. My friends and I went to get ice cream at night. Snapchat says it was around 10pm when the photos were taken, so it was within the 9.30 to 10.30 time frame. I live in a heavily wooded mountainous and desolate area of southern Pennsylvania. I'm actually in the Lycan Loop, an area where humanoids and supernatural creatures are often reported in Pennsylvania. I also live about a half hour away from both Camp David and Raven Rock Mountain. Fun fact, I've been to Camp David, and it's a pretty creepy place. Some believe that humanoids could be due to the government, which is why I've included it. Anyway, we were driving back home from getting ice cream and just having fun, and I decided to take photos of my friends in the back seat. I was probably Snapchatting someone, and just sending photos back and forth. I took two photos, and in the first one, something creepy appeared in the rear window. I immediately saved it, and looking back at the window, but neither me or my friend in the back could see anything. I took another picture for good measure, but it was no longer there. I took these pictures in total darkness with flash on. I highly doubt this could be some sort of reflection or glare. There's no glares or reflections on any of the windows or any of the photos. In any other circumstances, I take photos like this. I see no glares or reflections. That being said, why is the face so bright and easy to see? Was it just a trick of the phone? I was driving home from shopping. My mum was with me. It was somewhat dark in the middle of winter in Minnesota. We're somewhat out in the country. And there are road lights and medians, but not a ton of them. All of a sudden, this giant dog slash wolf thing leapt across the road about 25 feet in front of our car. It was a four lane road with a median. It made it, landing once on the median, and jumping again from there. The car's headlights, as well as the lights of the light pole, didn't penetrate it. It was pure black. It was like a shadow from within. It wasn't a deer. It was far too large for that, and the body shape was that of a wolf, or a large dog and it wasn't a moose for the same reasons, and definitely not a bear. Whatever it was, it was large enough that the bottom of its chest would have stood above the hood of the suburban we were in. As teenagers, when we go hang by the river and drink late at night, I stressed that it was a small neighbourhood, and where we went, no one else went. I'd bet only the three of us knew, that number includes all the kids, including myself, in the neighbourhood. Multiple times we all saw, at the same time, something humanoid, but distinctly not at the same time, watching us from the edges of the woods near our small clearing. We'd all hear voices as well, not from people living around there, and not a ton specifically, but just voices. One of the oddest happenings was when we were all about 15. We dragged an old couch to that hangout spot. It almost took us five hours. We hung out in the woods that night, but we were out until about 2am, heading back to one of our homes to set up a LAN and game a bit. About three hours later, someone realised they'd left something back there, and for the hell of it, as dawn was breaking, we all went with them. The couch, which was a sleeper and supremely heavy, was gone. Just 
gone. No drag marks other than the ones that we'd made, and no signs of a vehicle or anywhere else. How it had managed to disappear in that short time is still a mystery to us to this day. My father is an avid outdoorsman, and when I was a kid I tagged along. One night we were out driving to a hunting site in the middle of nowhere. We were driving down an old road, and we hadn't passed another car in quite a while. We were coming up on a pasture, and we could see a perfect circle of individual blue lights sitting out there on the ground, in the middle of this grazing pasture. It's hard to say how big the circle was, but I'd say it was at least the size of an average house. It was very unusual, just in itself. We were like, what the hell is that? Then exactly as we drive by, all of the lights turn off in a sequence around the circle. It was chilling. My dad doesn't get scared, or edgy, very easily. He immediately took us home a different way than we'd come, and we didn't drive back that way. He knew who owned the land, and called the guy, and he had no idea what it was, and was just as weirded out as we were. On another night, we were driving back from hunting in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. As we were going along, we come upon this woman, walking along this side of the road. Every hair I have stood on end, and there was just something not right about the situation. Besides, the obvious. It was an older woman dressed in old-time clothes. That wasn't all the crazy, though, because we were in a very rural part of West Texas, with a large population of Mennonites, as well as country people, who did dress that way. I could tell my dad was put off, but he was not going to just let some lady wander desolate roads in the middle of the night. He pulls up to the woman, but she keeps walking. He rolls down my window and asks her if she needs any help. She didn't reply in any way whatsoever. It was as if we weren't there at all. It was scary as hell. He kept trying, but there was nothing, so we took off in a hurry. Finally, on another occasion, we were out in the woods. I think we could have been checking traps and walking to a hunting blind on a lease. Anyway, we were walking along through the woods, and I just happened to look to my right and there was a clearing through the trees that went on for a ways, almost like a path. If you spent a lot of time in the woods, I'm sure you'd know what I mean. So I look out to my right, and I swear I saw a big hairy ape walk across that clearing in maybe one or two steps. That was the scariest thing. I still question whether it happened, or I hallucinated it. I mean, it was that scary and surreal. A bit of backstory before I start this. I live in Northern British Columbia, Canada, and a couple of years back, my friend had invited me to come with him, his mum, and his sister to a resort by a lake, an hour and a half or so out of town. This was at the end of June, and the beginning of July. This so-called resort wasn't exactly what I anticipated. It's a main log building, where you check in, but it's also a restaurant too. A few log cabins, and some spots down by the lake for RVs and stuff to park in. There's a highway that you turn off of onto the lot, where the check-in building is. And to the right of the highway is the forest for miles as well as everywhere else around that area. The only thing that stands out is the highway, which cuts through the woods. Around the lake, there's some houses and whatnot. But generally speaking, if it isn't a long weekend, there aren't too many people out there. 
The cabins and RVs area is separated and away from the main building, about a five to eight minute walk away. A little bit past the main building, there's a clearing where you could sit at a couple of tables that look like they haven't been used in about 10 years, as there are vines and grass that have grown around them. And about 10 feet into the woods, past those tables, there are two small lagoons surrounded by an old wire fence. The lagoons and table area are important for later. We got there in the evening, unloaded the car, got acquainted with the log cabin, which was really nice, by the way, and then we went out to explore around. Not too many interesting things happened on our first day, as we didn't explore a whole lot before dark. Skip to the next day, and it's cloudy and rainy, which we actually were hoping for, as that meant that there were very few people at the resort, and we would get free rain over it. We explore down by the lake and around the cabin area more thoroughly, and eventually make our way up to the clearing where the tables are located. We look at the tables and see that they haven't been touched in what looks like a long time from the amount of grass and weeds that has built up around it. And while investigating, I took notice that around 50 feet or so into the backwoods, there was what looked to be a clear area. We slid down into this ditch-like area, which was probably around eight foot difference in elevation from the nearest table area, and trampled through the brush. We eventually came to the spot, which we're pretty sure are lagoons due to the way they're constructed. We noticed there was a wire fence around it. We walked around the area planning to leave until we saw what looked like a spot where a large animal had walked over the fence and crushed a portion of it. Not really paying attention to the fact that a large animal may have been in the area, we dismissed those thoughts and said that it was probably bent like this for a long time. We tooled around the area, looking at the lagoons, and eventually we left, planning to come back the next day with big rocks to throw into the water as it was getting time to eat dinner. But the next day, we came back to the tables, planning to go into the lagoon area once again. But before we had a chance to go down the ditch, we stopped because of a noise. This is what triggered the rest of the events in this story. The noises we heard were those of walking over small twigs snapping them in the lagoon slash ditch area we had traveled the previous day. Keep in mind, those footsteps weren't there before. We stuck around for about 10 minutes or so, until we got hit with an intense feeling of dread. After this, we said screw this, and went back to our cabin where we played poker for the rest of the night. While playing, we discussed the events that had taken place and eventually laughed it off, saying it was probably just a bear passing through, or rabbits in the area. The next day it was raining heavily, and much darker than the past couple of days. We left our cabin and planned to go into the lagoon area later, but we wanted to chill around a medium forested area close to the cabins that I forgot to mention at the beginning of this story. As I previously said, after we had originally gone into the lagoon area, things started getting weird. We were messing around in the woods, breaking big sticks on trees, when we had heard what sounded to be someone doing the same thing about 200 feet away in the direction we were facing. It was hard to judge how far exactly it was, because of the way the forest carries sound, but it was pretty far in front of us. We wouldn't have cared too much about this until we took notice of where it actually was. The entire area around there and beyond is all forested. And having someone in those forests along with us that far in and in the less than favorable weather with very few people at the resort at that time is unlikely. We decided to leave the area and come back later during the evening, 
Spoiler alert, that wasn't a great idea. So after leaving that area, we went around to the lagoon area and listened for a few minutes. We couldn't hear anyone walking, so we assumed that we were right about it being a passing forest creature. Not even ten steps in, and I tell my friend to stop moving. We both stop and listen. We hear what sounds like the steps again. But as they're coming in louder and faster, we get that same overbearing feeling of dread. We hightail it out of there, spooked as hell, and we book it back to our cabin. Later that evening, we returned to the forest clearing from earlier, where we had heard the branch against the tree noise in the day. We again started smacking branches against trees, this time not hearing anything. But as I turned to my left, something caught my eye. There was what appeared to be a person standing behind a tree, and I saw them duck behind it when they noticed that I noticed them. I nearly crapped myself as I yelled to my friend that we needed to get out of there, and we sprinted back into the cabin. We returned the next day, and I took a picture of where the figure was standing. Later that night, while we're sitting in the loft area where our beds are, we have a discussion about what happened that day. There's much less joking this time, and we're trying to make sense of what happened. We started with the branch hitting the tree noise. At first, we tried to dismiss it by saying it was an echo, but remembered that the echoes weren't prominent at the time, especially five seconds after hitting the tree. Only I saw the hooded figure in the same area later, but I knew it was a person, or at least think it was a person. We weren't too sure about that, so we moved on to talking about the lagoon slash table area. Nothing really too interesting came up in that conversation. We left the next day as our booking had ended. This isn't the end of the story, however. We came back last year around the same time, but we had brought another friend with us. We showed him around and briefed him about what had happened the previous year, and he took it with a grain of salt, as any sane person would. This eventually changed over the next three days. The activity this time wasn't so much in the side forest where I'd seen the hooded figure and where me and my friends heard the tree noises, although we did hear the returning knocks again, but in the lagoon slash table area. I'll skip to the juicy stuff. So after showing our other friend the lagoon area, we decided to enter it after not hearing any noises. All went well and we returned the next day. This time the footsteps were there once again, but a bit closer than before. We left that area, but returned around an hour later. We were determined to see what was repelling us out of there, but to get in we had to be quiet. Slowly, we went down the ditch and to the lagoons without anything hearing us, and we didn't see anything there. We heard something snap a little bit away. So without making too much noise, we got out of there. The next and final day before we had to leave once again, we returned to the table slash lagoon area, where we were planning to go to the lagoons again. But when we were at the table area, we had heard something new. It was a sort of screeching noise, but it sounded like a person almost. At first, we thought it was a person, who had injured themselves and was calling for help. But I made everyone stop and just listen before doing anything. We listened to it, and from what I heard, it sounded like a mixture between a person yelling, an angry cat hissing, and a shallow dog bark. My two friends decided that they wanted to get closer and investigate the sound while I was opposed to it. We went regardless but I stayed much further away as my gut was telling me to get out of there. We threw rocks near the area from where the sound was in hopes to flush it out of its hiding spot, and when that didn't work, 
we got much too close. We were right at the edge of a ditch close to the tables, and when I got as close as my friends did, something happened. The thing that was making the sound had thrown either a large log or had knocked down a tree, judging by the sound. But I didn't exactly stick around to investigate. I turned tail and bolted down as fast as my legs would carry me. I was probably about 15 feet away from my friends as my danger reflexes were faster, and it registered to me faster that I needed to get the hell out of there. We were about 100 feet away when we came to a stop. Nothing came after us, but the sounds then resumed. We walked around the main building, and when we came around, there was a black bear standing there. We let out a sigh of relief, as we thought we had been spooked by a bear. But then we shifted back to our previous feelings of dread, when the bear did the same thing as us, and got out of there as fast as it could. We didn't investigate further, and ran back to our cabin. Nothing further happened as we left the following day, due to the reservation being over. I don't know what the lagoon slash table creature is, but I sure as hell know it's not any bear. The other thing in the forest, I'm still not sure about. I think that they're separate things, as the woodsman, or tree knocker as we've nicknamed it, is more elusive and seems to be luring us into that area. While the screecher is very territorial and aggressive, I've tried to find things online about similar experiences in the area, but I've come up empty, which is another reason why I'm sharing this. Does anyone have any ideas about what this could be? I have no clue what's going on. Despite the strange things going on there, the location is very beautiful. The cabins are nice despite the spring beds, and the food at the restaurant is also quite tasty. The place is called Purden Lake Resort. If you look it up on Google, it's the one with the green roof. I hope you enjoyed the story. The following stories are from an uncle on my mother's side. He's a considerably conservative man in his approach to most things, from political to taste in film, as he generally considers any cinema post-1950s to be absolute garbage. And I feel I should mention his disdain for the genres of horror and science fiction in entertainment before I continue. That said, I was surprised when a few years ago, I made a passing comment regarding alien abduction. For the life of me, I have no idea what prompted this, and he spoke seriously, and mentioned two encounters of his own. He seemed excited to share the stories, and enjoyed me listening to them. The first took place inside of a flat he rented in the mid-80s. The location was Stretford Road, Manchester, UK. Apparently, my uncle looks out of his bedroom window when a flying saucer appears directly opposite and sits still in the air. There are a row of windows separating the top and bottom of this saucer and inside are the shapes of people moving around. The saucer idles for around 10 seconds and then completely disappears. To this day, he claims the story to be genuine. Then, around the mid-80s, somewhere in Manchester, UK, my uncle used to be a mechanic. He was working at a friend's car at home, and needed a particular part, as the one he's looking at is severely damaged. He takes the part to another garage, hoping to negotiate price on a replacement, and asks the only guy working there if he has one. The guy smiles, takes the part from my uncle, and then returns 10 seconds later with the same part, and one completely identical. By identical, I mean that my uncle described it as a duplicate of the original, damaged in the exact same places, with the same blemishes and tells. Confused, my uncle takes the part from the mechanic, and as he studied them, 
the mechanic bursts into hysterics. Thinking it's a prank, my uncle calls Bo and asks where he got the part, to which the mechanic replies that he made it. My uncle left the shop with both parts, dumbfounded as how the mechanic had produced the identical part. Without reason, my uncle insists that this mechanic was an alien or something otherworldly. But I always thought his mind was tilted towards this explanation as per his alleged saucer experience. As for a possible explanation, it makes sense that car parts would be subject to similar examples of damage, and perhaps the mechanic in question noticed my uncle's part looked uncannily similar to one of his own, and saw room for a prank. Certainly explains the laughter. I'll have to apologise for the sparsity of detail in this one. I regret it was hard to find these out. I always thought of this story as its best to be weird, and at its worst to be casually explainable. I am a 17 year old female. I'd like to start off by saying that most consider me an intimidating person by nature. My close friends don't really believe that but they know that I most definitely do not mess around when it comes to certain situations, whether it's telling someone to piss off, as much as I hate to admit it, or getting physical with someone. I've never really had someone approach me in public, thinking of getting the best of me, if that makes sense. About half a year ago, I was at my then house, rolling some joints with my girlfriend. I live somewhat in the middle of nowhere, and there are lots of trees in my area, and they are also in my backyard. I wouldn't classify it as a whole ass forest, but it's not small enough to simply be a grove. There's wildlife there though. My girlfriend and I hadn't smoked much that day, and we were home alone, and seeing as we could do anything we wanted, we decided to smoke these while taking a bit of a nature walk and it seemed like an absolutely amazing idea at the time. My girlfriend sat next to me while I rolled the harvested God's gift in the paper. We were talking about random stuff and listening to heavy metal as I focused on rolling those sweet, sweet spliffs. I had finished rolling and we finally decided to leave my house and walk into the plain woods, which at the time had never been intimidating to me or anyone I'd been in there with, unless they were just major cowards by nature or had anxiety. I have the joints in my pocket. We leave, and we're walking through my backyard towards one of the many trails from my place. I should also mention it was summer, so it was only 7pm, and it wouldn't be getting dark for maybe two and a half to three hours. We light up, and... For about an hour or so, it's fine. We're just talking, kissing, basic couple stuff, and we're on our second joint, just walking along the paths. Then we see this big, flat rock, like a pancake boulder. Hell yeah! We sit on it and lay down. The two of us sit like that for a while, holding hands and passing the joint between us. Perhaps half hour after, we start hearing noises. I'd also like to mention at this point that the sun was starting to set, and perhaps there was another 30 minutes of daylight left, and that's when we started hearing the noises. We're obviously really freaked out by the sounds, and internally blamed it on the weed making us a little paranoid. There was wildlife in the forest as I'd mentioned, we were trespassing in their backyard, so why should we mind a cute bunny family making their way downtown? After a while of silence, we heard a noise that we both know damn well, and it's not an animal. We heard what sounded like someone running a sharp object against a solid but jagged surface, like a rock. It was pretty far away, but somehow it was loud enough that we heard it. 
It was faint though. We look at each other and immediately sit up. We don't see anything. I stand up and urge her to do the same as well. This most definitely wasn't the forest fairies we had planned on seeing. We stand for a minute or so, and then we hear a big snap, like a tree branch getting stepped on with a ton of force, and then fast footsteps, like some dude sprinting. I freak out and go into panic mode, as I'm wary to admit. And of course, we were deep into the woods. I urge my girlfriend Kimber to run faster and all the way towards my house. Now my girlfriend and I aren't exactly sporty people. We're more of the academic bunch, and we weren't completely out of shape, but looking back on it, it would have been a hell of a lot easier for us had we done cross country or track or something. She runs in front of me, and I'm a little further ahead. We aren't on trail at this point, and twigs and leaves are completely shredding our faces, necks, legs and arms. We hear this person, who's obviously running after us, start a hooting and hollering like some damn inbred from the hills have eyes. That makes us soil ourselves, and we run faster. We're sprinting, huffing and puffing like fat kids during the mile or something. The person is unfortunately closer at this point, and I look back and see him. He's an older guy, about 40s give or take with long hair, and thin as hell. He's scraggy looking. This, of course, makes me defecate pure cement. I yell at my girlfriend to hurry up, and she does. I look behind me again, and he is gaining on us. She makes a turn, and I recognize it as being the one to my house. The turn was abrupt, and I thank Jesus because the guy must have been too close to process the turn. We turn off, and see the lights of my house in the almost darkness. Seeing this beacon of hope made us run even harder. This guy can't be seen, and we make it to my cleared backyard. My girlfriend runs up the back porch, and rips the sliding door open, letting me in and locking it. She slams the blinds down to cover the door, and we make sure all the doors and windows are locked. I feel my back pocket for my phone, and realise that of course, it's somewhere in those damn trees. My girlfriend's phone is dead. No house phone, because who the hell has those anymore? It was a burden at the time. My girlfriend then breaks down, having a panic or anxiety attack. I'm not sure which one. We plug in her phone, get it charging, and I turn off all the lights, except for the ones by our doors. I saw no signs of the man for the rest of the night, and for the rest of the time I'd lived there. Her phone charged and we called the cops, and they surveyed the area and found nothing. It was terrifying for me, and I can only imagine it's worse for my girlfriend, who suffers from anxiety. This was probably around four or five years ago. Four friends and I had been talking about ghost experiences and such, when we decided to try and find some places to go investigate for fun. A quick bit of research revealed some stories about a place called Old House Road. Claims of a witch, green lights from the ground, and a ghost ship that sailed over the beach and anchored. We decided to take the three hour drive to go visit. The road itself was probably a mile and a half, maybe two, gravel road, surrounded by grass and weeds, and plants at least six foot tall. It's right by the water, a little private beach. On this road, perhaps two thirds of the way, is a little old abandoned house, and there was not a single source of light on the whole stretch. So we drove down all the way, noting that it's pretty dark here. We parked by the beach, stepped out, and walked as a group towards the house. We take a couple of turns and such, 
before we reach a long, straight way to the house. We're walking and talking, searching for things with our flashlight, when someone points out a light in the distance. This light, we all observed, was down near where the house was, but directly in the path. We kept walking, slightly cautious now. This is when we realize that the light is getting closer than we expect. We stop, and the light continues to come closer. It's at this point I observe that it's not like a flashlight or a car light. This is a torch, or a lantern, swaying slowly back and forth as it approaches, and it's not illuminating anything behind it. My friend Jay is the only other one in this group that has experience for searching with things like this. He taps me on the shoulder and whispers, shark attack. He meant that the lantern was a distraction. So we both turned around just to see two small red lights peering over the tall grass before quickly dropping back down into said grass. At this point, everyone else is transfixed on the light ahead. So me and Jay calmly turned everyone around and said tonight is not the night to be messing with this. We got everyone back into the car calmly before we explained what we'd seen. Once at the car, I decided to step back and see if anything had followed. I walked towards the first turn, where I could still be seen. I heard some movement ahead and said hello, and promptly got hit by a rock. Not hard though, it was on my knee. I was more confused than anything. I received another rock and this time it was to my chest. I got the message. It means get the hell out. So I go back, we all go into the car and decide it's time to return home. It's worth noting that on the drive down the road, we saw absolutely no sign of lights or people or anything. Just the same empty road we'd taken to get there. We left Old House Road shortly after. At this point, we discussed the fact that we drove three hours to spend 15 minutes in one spot. Consensus was, screw that. So we looked for a place that was in our own path home. And boy, did we find something. I will probably never remember the name of the bridge, but I'm sure I could text Jay and find out. The place was an overpassing bridge in the middle of nowhere on some side street that was probably 15 miles long. We drive over there, someone reading the claims out to everyone. The story goes that there was a bride who ran from her arranged marriage on her wedding day, running over the bridge, stopping and jumping off in her wedding gown and dying. Neat, right? Coupled with that, was very factual and documented evidence of KKK activity in the 70s. They'd hung many people on this road, hanging off trees right next to it. So, not cool. What were the problems, you ask? They say that if you parked your car under said overpass, you could hear the bride fall onto your car, see handprints on your mirrors, but see no corpse. They also claimed that if you parked there, your battery would die, and car would become inoperable. Tow companies came out a lot apparently, and further down the road, people claimed seeing dead men hanging in the trees. We go down the road, and this overpass is nestled neatly in the lowest part of the valley, made by two moderately sized hills. You can see the top of another side around the bridge. Not very intimidated, we made the decision not to stop under the bridge, for we were all hours from the house, and just decided to screw that. We drive under it and saw nothing. It was very uneventful, so we continued down the road. I can't explain how dark this road was, 
no street lights, no signs, no anything. Just dense woods on either side of the street. As unsettling as that was, we found a little wider dirt shoulder and turned around maybe a third of the way down the road. Back under the bridge we go. Pass number two was interesting. We go down back the hill and past the bridge. As we do, the car lights are very noticeably dim and then come back. Everyone saw it. Intrigued now, we U-turn and like typical young people, we drive down once more. This time the car audibly stutters and we all feel it. Well damn, we U-turn, cross the fourth time and the car radio shuts off and the car almost completely stalls. This is the point where we should call it. It's close to the witching hour. We've already had an encounter and the car is threatening to die on us. But alas, we're dumb. So onwards we go. We drive and as we're approaching the bridge, we see headlights on the other side. So we stop, feeling slightly compelled to. This is where it gets weird. We had a couple of people recording at this point and we all are very distinctly pointing out two pairs of headlights descending the opposite hill. Four in total. This man is not wearing a uniform or badge, but is driving a local police vehicle. He rolls down his window and stops. No blue lights. He tells us that they've been monitoring our traffic patterns since we'd been there and told us it was illegal to be driving back and forth on this road like that. Top that all off, he just seemed abnormal. His facial expression was fairly locked in place. He spoke very slowly and deliberately, and it was just off-putting. I apologize, but it's hard to put into words. It just felt wrong. Regardless, he told us to leave, and then watched us three-point turn and then go away. He drove off with us behind him until the stop sign. He turned right and GPS told us to follow him. When we do, he's gone. We were very shaken. We stop at a gas station for snacks and nicotine. We exchange a review or two of the three videos recorded and point out the distinct four lights. But the back two that disappeared when they reached the bridge weren't connected like headlights, almost like it were two motorcycles. If I ever get the chance, I'll get someone who might have the video and upload them. But that's a good one. It got to us, and we didn't go out like that again. But I do joke around about going to Old House Road again sometime. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area, main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach, which was weird because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette 
moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird. I was in my early 30s, and had been grieving the loss of my partner a few years earlier. So I regularly went walking alone with my two dogs. One was a bold little pug, and the other a ridgeback cross, but was a total worse. I lived in a beautiful place, a temperate rainforest in a mountainous area of southern Australia. Many creeks and lots of tree fern forests. It's also sparsely populated due to the terrain, and on this occasion I was walking around the grassy oval by the creek on the outskirts of a small mountain village. Dealing with the grief had been difficult, and I often enjoyed a drink and a joint on these walks. It was time out for me though. I took a seat by the oval, cracked my bevo and sparked up watching the dogs do their thing just sniffing about. I'd been chilling for a few minutes when I notice an old guy walking his dog across the oval. I can see he's smoking and has a beer in his hand. My kind of person. As he gets closer, our dogs meet and play, and we soon get to chatting. I recognize his accent. He's from Liverpool, England. He's about 60 and lives with his elderly mother in this town. We're just chatting away for a good half hour, having a nice time on this cool autumn day. He's an interesting guy, so we plan to maybe catch up for a coffee next time I'm in the area. He doesn't have a mobile, so he writes down his home phone number for me on a scrap of paper. Cool, new friend. So conversation turns to when and how he came to Australia. 11 years ago, he arrives, he tells me. I ask what prompted the move. Suddenly, it gets weird. He killed a guy, stabbed him in Liverpool, fled the country and came here. You heard that right. What the hell? So I wind things up pretty quickly now, but still trying to make it seem casual and normal. Hustle the dogs in the car, tell the dude that we'll catch up, and hightail it out of there. It's been at least five years since this incident, but I haven't been back to that area since. Just in case, I run into that murderous scouse again. I worked for the Country Agriculture Department one summer. My co-workers and I drove out to the orchards to put up some insect experiments. Sometimes the locations were pretty far from civilization. This one particular walnut orchard was about an hour away from a very small town. It was scraggly looking, not very well managed, lots of weeds and diseased trees, which made it good for insect research, because there were so many. The trees were big and old. The place put out a very uneasy, creepy feeling. None of us liked visiting that orchard. We always rushed in to change the bug traps and rushed out so we didn't spend any more time than we had to. One day, the three of us are driving to it, when we make the final turn into the property. There's a cop car blocking the middle of the road, with a police do not cross tape 
stretched across the dirt road. We park, get out, explain to the officer what we're doing there and ask what's going on. There's a dead body in the orchard. He asks if there's anything we know about it. No, we just got there. He says they're investigating, and it might take a week. Fine by us. We called our boss and told him we weren't going back to that place. Here's the kicker. We were late to getting to the orchard that day. Had it been our first stop in the morning like it usually was, we would have stumbled across that body. Or maybe even the event that caused it. Let me set up stage. At the time, I was living in Traverse City, Michigan. Beautiful landscape for those wondering. Huge glacier-carved hills and Lake Michigan at your back. I rented a little townhouse with a longtime friend a little ways outside the city. I had just gotten a hold of my old bicycle, which I had shipped up from my old hometown, and I was raring to start riding around. And that's how this all got started. It was my day off, and I decided to save gas and ride my bike into town. I geared up, checked my tires, and roared off. I had been big on riding my bike once upon a time, and it came back like, well, riding a bike. What I didn't notice, however, was how quickly I was moving. If I had been paying attention, I would have realized the constant downward slope I was on and how biking back up would most likely pose a difficulty for my winter lapsed muscles. But none of that mattered at the time. I made it into town, did some shopping, met up with my roommate for dinner, and generally had a good time till I noticed the sun was setting. I bid my adieus, hopped on my bike, and pedaled off into the sunset. At first I did alright, but that aforementioned incline wore me down. By the time I reached the last leg of my journey, it was pitch black, and I was walking my bike. At which point, the road faced me with a choice. To my left was the regular road, which was lit better, but also a longer trek to get to the townhouse row I occupied. To my right was a more direct route to and from town. I drove it every day, and in fact, had used it to come into town that very same day. It was heavily wooded and unlit, but featuring a shorter route, albeit with a steeper hill. I figured since I was already walking, I might as well just take the shorter, familiar path. So I turned on my bike's headlamp and headed into the even greater darkness of the road through the woods. It all went well for a bit. I trudged along, and cursed myself for being so stupid and overconfident with my bike. Then I heard it. Footsteps off to my right side in the woodlands. I stood still and they stopped abruptly. There in the blackness, I debated what it might be. But as a veteran of the woods, I hoped it was just local wildlife and continued on. The footsteps started up again. They stopped when I stopped just a hint later. I started and stopped once more, to be sure that I wasn't hearing things. This last time, the steps continued for a solid ten seconds after I had stopped, making me sure something, or someone, was out there. I still do not know what, though I logically leaned towards human, as the gait sounded bipedal and more precise than a quadruped. With this in mind, I weighed my options. If I dropped the bike and ran towards home, it would be far too easy to catch me. The same was even true if I ran back towards town. I was not in any way prepared for a chase, and I didn't want to initiate one. My mind strayed to the utility knife that I always carry in my purse, but I shoved that thought aside. I have enough martial arts training to know the knife was a bad idea, and I was more comfortable taking whoever or whatever was out barehanded, rather than escalating things with a blade. Instead, 
I called my roommate who was still in town, gave her my location, and told her what was happening. She told me she'd be there in 10 minutes. I hung up, and started walking again. The footsteps started up too, this time faster and clearly out of sync with my own. And that's when I got mad. I have a weird thing where fear makes me angry and hostile, and being followed through the woods had officially punched my buttons from terrified to murderous. So I turned to the woods and roared with a voice I didn't know I had. How about you come out and face me, you piece of crap. I'll rip your stomach open and wear your intestines for a necklace. For the life of me, I don't know where I got the guts or the words for that. It might as well have been a bad move, but the woods were rather abruptly quiet and nothing came at me. I stayed still, staring hard, ready to beat the ever loving crap out of anything that moved, but nothing did. Then my roomie came on scene, her headlights almost blinding me as she turned the curve to where I was. I tossed my bike into her car, and we hauled ass somewhere. I collapsed once I got home, vomited from pure nerves, and finally crashed at 3am. And that's my story. Was it a person? An animal? I feel compelled to lead towards the former if for no better reason than because it sounded like a person walking, and what animal would just be so precise in following and winding me up? But who knows? Maybe I scared the crap out of some poor porcupine. Regardless, I'd rather not encounter it again. When I took the plane to Istanbul with my classmates in 2012 or 2013, I saw somewhere over the route from Germany to Turkey, a weird black round object in the sky. When I told my female friend who was sitting next to me, we both started freaking out and filmed the entire thing. But you can't see it on our cell phones since there were too many water droplets on the window and that black thing was too far away. It was something small and round and some other round object was flying around the main object, surrounded by black smoke. It was so beautiful. I was sure it was some technology from the government. I regret not screaming inside the plane and making everyone aware of it. Imagine everyone if they'd have seen it. They'd have freaked out, and our plane would have probably gone missing. What if it was top secret? But jokes aside, I'll never forget this incident. When I told my aunt, she told me that I was too stressed and needed to take a break as I was imagining things. My next two encounters where I saw something strange, I can't explain either. I was in elementary school, sixth grade. I was outside going to our PE classes with my female friend in tow. When I wanted to get inside this building, I saw in front of me, some kind of small white cloud passing by. As weird as it sounds, it was flying by really fast. I told my friend, and she also saw it. But we didn't talk about it again until later. I remember I saw this kind of cloud in my young age again. I don't remember where it was, but I remember I saw this cloud twice. I believe that we were living in a dimension where we can't see everything. For example, that cats and dogs can see things we cannot. Perhaps that cloud was from somewhere where we weren't supposed to see it. I tried finding information on Google regarding both incidences, but I have found nothing. There is one final entry. When I was a child, I slept next to my mother. One night, Someone came and put my arm up, which hurt me so I screamed. The person ran away, and my mum asked me what happened. She told me I shouldn't be scared, that it was my dad. Until today, I can't believe this. When asking my parents, they tell me it was my dad who came and tried to change my bad sleeping position. 
I can't believe this. Because why would he run away when I started to scream and cry? He's not like that. Not to mention the person or thing I saw looked scary. It was dark and he was pitch black looking and I could only see his eyes. All I could see was a silhouette. Believe me or not, since then I've had bad dreams of this person every night when I fall asleep on my left side. I remember my mum told me once when we were sleeping on our left side that we have bad dreams. Maybe she was joking, but it left a big impact on me. Every night, I tried to make sure I didn't sleep on my left side so that I wouldn't see that person again. I saw him several years later. It was a real trauma for me, and I really don't think it was my dad. Finally, there's one more. I was with my family in the living room. All my cousins were there. They'd come from the Netherlands to visit. In the evening, we were telling each other creepy stories. After that, we went into the living room, watched some TV and talked. Suddenly, I saw the other room where lights were still turned on. I could see on the wall the shadow of a water bottle, but there was something round and huge flying around it. Actually, I kept staring at it and wondering what it could be. Then it stopped. It was very strange. I wish I knew what it was. This happened a long time ago. I'd say this happened when I was around eight, 11 years ago, in fact. My family and I were on holiday in Spain, in a city quite close to Barcelona. We went to a very big and luxurious resort with a ton of sports fields, from basketball to soccer. It took up a lot of space and it had really tall fences around the perimeter to make sure no one could get in at night. To give you some perspective, I think they had eight soccer fields, four basketball courts, two rugby pitches, and probably some other stuff too. During the day, all of the fields were full of people playing sports, and it was always a ton of fun there. But at night, the perimeter closes. I stayed late with a friend. I don't remember his name, so we'll call him Brian. Brian and I didn't want to go home yet, so we stayed a bit longer to shoot penalties on the soccer field. Eventually, they closed the fence, but since we were too far away from them to see us and vice versa, we only found out that the fence was closed when we tried to leave. This was already scary. It was a huge, unlit place in a foreign country, surrounded by big fences. After freaking out for a little, we decided we didn't want to get into trouble. So we set out to follow the fence to look for holes through which we could escape instead of calling for help. After a solid 20 minutes, we find a hole, but it's not connected to the resort but to a dark forest. We figured it wasn't a large forest and that it would be safe given that it was right next to the resort. We go through the hole and begin crossing the forest. A mere five minutes later, we enter a large bare spot with an old, damaged, graffitied concrete shed. We avoided it as best we could. But soon we heard some glass bottles moving around in the shed. Out walks this old man. He stares at us for 10 seconds. We are paralyzed by fear. He looks deranged, like someone who had been homeless for the larger part of his life. His clothes were ripped, hair and beard very long and disgusting. He even had a limp. He coughs which wakes up another man in the shed. This looks exactly like Charles Patashik from Breaking Bad. 
They start to slowly walk in our direction, speaking to us in Spanish. We slowly back up. They see this, and they charge. They start running, screaming, and throwing stuff at us. We are running for our lives. The forest is pitch black. We can barely see ahead of us, let alone see if there's an end to this seemingly infinite forest. After about 10 minutes of running, we reach the edge of the forest. We were on a small town road next to a huge cliff. There were no houses, no people, and we were still being chased. We follow the road uphill, finally gaining some ground on the homeless psychopaths. The road ends. The only thing we see is a mansion without any burning lights. We figure it's all or nothing, and we climb their gate and hide in their backyard. The homeless men follow us, but by the time they managed to get in, we were already hidden in some dense, dark bushes. They made quite a bit of noise, which woke up the residents. Out comes a man screaming and looking around his garden. He closely passes by us, but did not see us. He was holding a gun. I didn't get a close look, but I think it was a shotgun, an older one that holds two shells. He inevitably spots the homeless men and fired a warning shot into the air. The Charles Patashik looking man charges at him, but gets knocked down. He forces the homeless men out of his garden at gunpoint. We fought safe for a second until we realized we were in a shotgun wielding man's garden and that we did not know where the homeless men were. We wait a bit to be sure that the man is asleep and that the homeless men have left. When we leave around a half hour later, the men are gone and the roads are quiet. We follow the same road, but now downhill and run into a small town we still have no idea where we are. It has been three hours since we left the resort, and we finally realized what just happened and freaked out. After walking for another 10 to 15 minutes, we see a house with people in the living room. We ring the bell and try to ask the way. Most Spanish people don't speak Dutch, and we didn't really speak English all that well. We told her the name of the resort, and she points downhill. This seems like a fairly standard road. We stick closely to the houses and follow the road. I didn't know this at this point, but apparently there was an abandoned slaughterhouse close to the entrance of the resort. We heard Dutch voices from somewhere around the building, so we go in asking directions. Enter a bloody hellhole. Everywhere, there's blood. On the floor, on the walls, on the equipment, and even the ceiling. Bloody knives everywhere. It wasn't a very nice experience. The other people run into us as we ask directions. It's a two minute walk away. When we finally hit the resort, the staff don't let us in, because they don't know if we're residents of the resort. They make us tell them the house of our parents to come and get us. There were still pancakes left when I got back, and I played Pokemon with my brother. My mum gave me 10 euros for the arcade the next day, which was when my bike got stolen. When I was about 11, I was living with my grandmother. My bed was in the corner of my room, with the long side against the wall, and right up against the window. I slept with my head towards the wall, and I was usually turning towards the wall with the window. This window was a weird size, and didn't have any blinds, just curtains. The curtains hung in front of the window, so there was a small gap towards the side of the window where you could see into or out of my room if you were standing at the right angle. I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep when I turned my eyes towards the window 
and saw something standing there looking right at me. It was just a silhouette, but something about the way it was shaped just felt wrong. The head was large, the body was a little too skinny, and the way it was bent over just didn't feel right at all. I tried to act like I was asleep, and rolled over ever so slightly to try and get a better look, but it stood back up and ran away. It was tall, at least six foot. I hopped out of bed and ran into the living room where my grandmother was watching the 10 o'clock news. I told her I'd seen someone looking into my window. She grabbed a flashlight and ran out. I followed her and we looked around trying to figure out what it was. We couldn't see anything at all. And after that night, we set the curtains further back, so they completely blocked out the window. About 10 years ago, I lived in Virginia with my then girlfriend, who was working on an internship there. We're pretty outdoorsy type, and would periodically go to hike in various places around where we lived. I can't remember exactly where it was, to be honest, but we had driven out into the middle of nowhere in order to hike a particular nature reserve. To get there, we drove a long ways down a windy country back road, and then the final bit was on a one lane dirt road to the trailhead. Driving down the dirt road, there was nothing but pasture land for several miles, some empty some full of cows. It was rather remote, sparsely populated, and I would guess that we passed perhaps two to three houses, or their driveways anyway, in total. Probably a thousand acres per house kind of deal. We hiked, uneventfully, and got in the car to drive back home near sunset. The landscape was such that there were a lot of tiny rolling hills, so we were driving up and down frequently. As we crested one of these hills, we both saw a white 50s-ish farm truck barreling down the road towards us at somewhat of an alarming speed. Given the diminished visibility, and the fact that it was a literally one lane road with nowhere in sight to pull off, my girlfriend was driving and we were both like, oh crap, that guy's driving really fast and we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. She slowed down in anticipation and we waited for the truck to arrive. As we waited, we did a couple more up and down the hills while nervously looking for the truck, which had to be on us at any second by this point. Only, the truck never arrived. It was the weirdest thing. We both saw it. We were both nervous about it hitting us. And the damn thing just disappeared. We hadn't passed any driveways. And once we realized the truck was gone, I kept my eye out for a driveway. Because that would explain it. But nope. Nothing. The truck was simply gone. I am normally a logical person, but I have no explanation other than I think we saw a ghost truck. This happened 10 years ago. My parents agreed not to tell me about it because they knew it would terrify me. I only found out recently because my older brother let it slip. To preface this story, both of my parents are extremely rational people, both scientists and skeptics, but they don't like to talk about this because they can't explain it. They won't admit it, but I can tell it scared them, and they will change the subject whenever I bring it up. I've gone to great lengths to try and find a reasonable explanation for the following, but all I have are scraps. My mother has admitted to me, despite her non-believing nature, 
that if there's anyone who could have had contact with the supernatural or extraterrestrials, it would be me. She tells me that sometimes as a baby, I'd look at her and she'd get chills down her spine, like there was something I knew. From a very young age, I had an innate and irrational fear of the classic alien image. My dad, being a bit of a prankster, used to get a kick out of hiding a little glow-in-the-dark plushy green alien on my shelf, because he knew that I would start screaming in terror from my crib the moment I saw it. Recently, I was going through old home videos and found footage of me, three years old, sitting at the foot of my little bed, wordlessly staring at the toy across the room. Before I could get up and pace back and forth to the window to peek out the blinds up at the sky and pace back, in the video, my dad asked me why I wasn't scared. I told him it was because it wasn't dark outside. My family used to spend summers at our cottage home in the middle of nowhere, Nova Scotia. By middle of nowhere, I really mean it. Our road is unpaved and the land itself used to be a cattle farm run by my great-great-grandfather before it was sold and overgrown. We have very minimal internet connection, as it's a recent development too, that we have to get via radio tower from the next town over. There have been nights when my dad and I have been outside stargazing, as he fancies himself an amateur astronomer we've seen satellite-like objects moving low in the sky in a zigzag, unpredictably and impossibly smooth in motion, before it disappeared. There's no flashing to indicate a passenger aircraft or helicopter, and it's always far too fast. My dad's reaction is usually just, oh, that's weird, and we forget about it. One night, my mother woke up to the phone ringing. You know that state of being half awake, where you take a few moments to process anything, and you're not sure if you're in a dream? That's how she described what was happening. She picked it up and heard no dial tone, only the continued ringing of the phone, before she realized it wasn't ringing in the regular pattern of long, short, short. More like a completely irregular sequence of half rings and drawn out ones. This happened a few more times before she'd woken up enough to sit up in bed and notice that she thought it was daylight outside, and was actually a sky so solidly bright purple, it was luminescent, accompanied by the sound we can only describe as the noise made by the TARDIS in Doctor Who. She said this half laughing. The electric radio clock next to the phone flashed something around 3.15am, but it was clearly broken, as if the power had gone out despite the phone ringing, and needed to be reset. By this time, my dad had also woken up and confirmed that they were both seeing and hearing the same thing. Somehow, and without any further memory, they both went back to sleep. The next morning, there was no evidence of what happened, except the radio clock needing to be reset. No other appliances in the house were affected. My bedroom is an attic-style space on the other side of the house, and the only way to get up to me is to climb up a ladder, as I like being high, as it makes me feel safe. My mum asked me tentatively if I had any weird dreams, and apparently that night, I dreamt I was flying. My dreams have always been surreally vivid. There was a period of time after learning about this story, I was seriously worried I may have been abducted, and I'm starting to worry that they're going to come back for me. My family have a cabin. It's actually a two-story house up in the Appalachian Mountains, but we call it a cabin. We share it with our extended family, and I've got the absolute best memories up there. But the house is nearly 200 years old, and when you're up there all alone, or sometimes in the dead of night, it 
just feels off. And nearly everyone has experienced some sort of bizarre experience there. The house sits on 350 acres. And one day, my grandfather went out hunting on the property. The sun was just beginning to set when he saw some sort of big black creature sitting near a tree line. It and my grandfather stared at each other, and my grandfather fired a shot into the air, hoping to scare it. The creature stood up on its hind legs and walked back into the forest. He said the face was very cat-like, and it had a slinking gait with its long black tail. He was an avid hunter, his whole life, and knew of every kind of creature that lived in those mountains. But he'd never seen such a weird creature as that. And then, a couple of days later, as my immediate family and I were visiting, I saw some weird creature through my bedroom window at night. It looked like an enormous black wolf. When we locked eyes, it ran straight at me and I instinctively jumped back. When I looked out again, it was gone. But my mum had an experience that chilled me to the bone. For some reason, she was spending the night in the room that I usually stay in when I go up there. I don't remember the reasoning for it, but I hadn't joined her on the trip that time. She awoke in the middle of the night to a strange tapping noise against the hardwood floor. She stayed absolutely still and listened as the tapping turned to what sounded like claws scraping against the floor. They started from one end of the room, traveled across the floor under the bed she was sleeping in and ended in front of the closed closet door. She was on her side facing the closet, but she kept her eyes closed and scarcely breathed she says it was the most terrified she has ever been. Apparently, this clawing noise continued off and on throughout the whole night, and she didn't really get any sleep. There was even a moment that it seemed to hesitate next to her bed, and she could feel something staring at her mere inches from her face. So yeah, those are a few of the experiences that I know of that have happened there, but it's such a lovely house and I have the most fantastic and wonderful memories from there. And I've spent the night in that very same room that my mum had the terrifying experience in many times since, even as recently as last weekend, and I've never heard or seen anything while sleeping there. This happened to my friend Devon and I about five years ago. I don't want to release exactly where this occurred for the sake of anonymity. You see, Devon and I had been close friends since we were kids. I remember me and my mum and my friends all hanging out at the park and taking pictures when we were younger. He was like a second son to my mother. We grew up playing video games, eating junk food, staying up late, climbing out the windows and sneaking off into each other's houses, doing all those goofy things that kids do. We fought, made up, and have a long, long history of friendship. He was my best friend. We had spent all our childhood and teenage years together. We'd gotten relationships and slowly drifted apart as our lives, wives, and priorities took hold. We were both about 35 when this happened. His wife Emma and my wife Jane were going to go do their own thing with the kids and it was just a man's weekend going hunting. Me and my bro. It was late in the night. We had already established our camp and were making a plan of where we were going to go next. We were quite familiar with the terrain as we had hunted here before and were very excited for what tomorrow would bring, and what we could possibly hunt. The last time we'd come out, you see, our hunt was uneventful, and we returned home empty-handed. 
This pushed us further to aim to get something good. As we were discussing our plan, did we notice a strange sound off in the distance? Sort of like a hum, a very low hum, almost magnetic sounding, if that makes sense. We both in unison stop talking and look up into the sky where the sound is coming from. There's nothing but a blanket of stars and our pale firelight illuminating our small camp. We listen attently. The sound is still there and very real. However, we can't sense exactly where it's coming from. We're getting a bit put off. Continue making our plan. And by the time we're finished, it's still there. It's really bothering us. We agree the best course of action would probably be to go to sleep. Perhaps we're just hearing things. It must be some strange animal we've never heard, we thought. Animals do make weird sounds. We both go to sleep in our individual tents and pass out. There's something, though, that bothered me. And a few hours later, the sound had changed. It was more powerful than before. And I swore I could see bright lights flashing over my tent. I thought he was messing with me. So in my sleepy haze, I open the tent and look around. Lights are coming from above and I can see some sort of object floating just above. It is definitely the genesis of this strange noise, now louder than ever. All that I remember is passing out and waking up in the morning, far past the hour of which I should have awoken. My phone alarm didn't even go off. I wasn't sure what was happening then. So I picked myself up off the dirt and looked around. Our campfire had long extinguished. And I looked over to Devon's tent. He wasn't in there. I poked around, shouted his name, but there was no reply anywhere. I was quite scared. Had he started the hunt without me? I looked into his tent one more time and found his gear stashed underneath his sleeping bag, which was empty. I opened it up all the way and that was it. It was completely empty, the bag. He was nowhere to be seen. I tried putting my fear aside, assuming that he'd probably just gone to the toilet. So I shouted his name into the wilderness and received no reply. I found this very daunting, and I sat there for what felt like hours, and he didn't return. By this point, I was getting absolutely terrified that my friend had died in the wilderness. So, I left the camp after sending him a text and started to leave. I did all the necessary proceedings regarding a search and rescue to try and getting found because I was incredibly concerned for my friend. The weird thing was, when I called my wife and told her he was missing, she didn't know who I was talking about. I told her that he was my best friend, and this wasn't a time to mess around, especially with him gone. Note, I omitted everything about the lights and the noise last night. She started getting angry at me, telling her that I was just wasting her time and not to work her up over nothing, and that I sounded drunk or high and that I should come home now. I was beyond pissed. What was going on here? I look through my phone and find the number of Devon's wife, give her a call, but she doesn't pick up. I send her a text asking if she'd heard from him. And a few hours later, I receive a reply. Who is this? What the hell was going on? Safe to say they never found his body. They never found anything. When I got home, everyone I spoke to was acting like I was going insane. I learnt to drop the subject. I have no idea what's going on. It's like that night, 
he was erased from reality. Every trace of him, his wife, who apparently we don't speak to and don't even know, his family, I'd never met. My mum didn't even know who he was. And the pictures of him and I together as children, I can no longer find, both electronically and physically. He doesn't exist, and I'm the only person that remembers him. Have I gone insane? Some people believe I fell on a rock. That's why I woke up that way and imagined this whole thing. But that can't be real. Can it? Devon buddy, if you're out there, send me a sign. I think I'm losing my mind. There's this forest near where I live. Flora and fauna is what we call it here. People used to walk through, have picnics and run in it. I used it to run there with my dad a lot. So I knew the paths quite well. And I usually go there to escape from reality and listen to my iPod. This whole thing started last year. I drove and parked in the parking lot of the place to revise my notes for an exam I had. While I was in the car, this guy was walking around the parking lot and kept passing my car and looking in at me. It was pretty creepy, so I left. Now today I went to the flora and fauna to go for a walk and listen to music. As soon as I pulled into the parking lot, I saw the same creepy guy sitting in his van. I park on the far side of the lot. There are two entrances to flora and fauna, a main one and a side one, and I was parked right next to the side one. I stayed in my car a few minutes and get out and walk through the side entrance. And I noticed that the creepy guy had also gotten out of his van. I decide not to walk down any of the smaller windy paths. And I turn into a small path that leads to the main path you cross right through the flora and fauna. This route I took was kind of unique, as in you wouldn't choose it usually, because you could just take the main entrance that goes directly onto the main path as it was quicker. And I was hoping that it would lead me away from the creepy guy and to an area that had people in it. I noticed that he was taking the same path as me. So I walk faster towards this other woman who is walking on the main path as well. He follows me to the main path too. And I message my friend and let her know what's up and then call her. I stay behind this woman for about 10 minutes and the guy is about five to 10 meters behind me. I keep glancing sideways to see how close he is. I stay behind this woman for about 10 minutes and the guy is about five to 10 meters behind me. I keep glancing sideways to see how close he is. I get in front of the woman and I'm about 200 meters from the other side of the flora and fauna. And there's this couple with a pram walking towards us. I look back and the creepy guy has turned around. I stay on the phone with my friend until I get back to my car. And when I come back to the parking lot, the creepy guy is in his van, which has been moved and was a lot closer to my car. He watches me get in and drive away. So creepy guy, please, let's never meet again. This was on my parents' property a couple of years ago. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to go on a short hike at around midnight. I was walking down a beaten path with my rifle-mounted flashlight pointing forwards. It was really misty. I could see the silhouettes of trees, but nothing detailed. I got to my uncle's one-room cabin about a quarter of a mile from my house and took a seat on his picnic table. After sitting there for a while, I got up and turned to my right and took about five steps into the grass. I pointed my flashlight and into the mist, I could see two yellow predator eyes glowing at about stomach level, not 10 feet away from me. 
I stood there for at least five long minutes, just looking into its eyes with my rifle pointed right between them. It didn't move or make a sound, just blinking every couple of seconds. I stared back silently, while trying to keep my composure. All at once, the eyes were gone. I walked forwards to where it must have been standing, and I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. No rustle of grass, no twig breaking, no dent in the ground. It was just gone. I ended up walking back home after that. I never did see its body, just its floating eyes. A few months back, my girlfriend and I were bored hanging out around the house, and spontaneously decided to go out for a hike. We don't go hiking often, but the idea appealed to the both of us, and even though there was only about an hour left of light, we figured we had enough time to go and enjoy a hike before it got too dark. We quickly filled up our water bottles and put on the best walking shoes we had and were out of the door driving up into the mountains. Around my area, there are many hiking trails, with the variety of trails increasing as you go up the mountain. We tended to stay around the base of the mountain in the occasional case that we'd do a hike, where most people would still be walking. But we wanted to change things up and progressed further up the mountain road to a trail a friend of mine had mentioned. We kept in mind our time and figured that we could hike for a bit and simply enjoy the new environment and finish up before it got too late. We arrived at the trailhead and see that there were no cars left along the road where the trail commences. We didn't think too much of it though due to the time. We still had a good 45 minutes until dark, so we trooped on. We started walking down a fairly steep hill that then recoups the elevation at the bottom with an equally steep hill that you have to ascend. We reach the top, and then it's smooth sailing from there on out. We see a lone coyote off the trails a way off, and some rabbits, and I made a quip about how those rabbits might need to be careful with that coyote lurking around. She playfully hit me for that one. Approximately less than a mile into the trail, we see a large fallen tree that made a bridge over a dried riverbed, and decided to take a rest, climb around on it, and take pictures. We were there for roughly 10 minutes, and then resumed hiking. We continue on the trail for a short distance, until she hears a rustle in the trees behind us. We stop, mildly spooked, due to the assumed size of whatever made the rustling but continue on only briefly before she decides she's done and that we need to head back. It's twilight now, so I agree with her, so we turn around and head back to the car. When we made it back to the fallen tree, my shoe had come untied, so I used the trunk to fix my loose laces and look behind us for the first time on the hike, which is uncharacteristic of me, but hey, I was having fun, and there was no need to be paranoid. I see a person dressed entirely in black, with their hood on. That was a significant distance behind us, walking at a slow, even pace. It wasn't something out of the ordinary, so what if they're wearing black with their hood on? I wear black most of the time, and it's cold out. I shouldn't make assumptions right. This does trigger me to be more alert, however, and I inform my girlfriend of this person's presence. It's dusk now. We continue on at an intentionally faster pace and go through a winding section of the trail, and I lose sight of the person. When we come around the final bend of the section, I figure that they're far behind us now, and that there's nothing to worry about. Sooner than later, the person is behind us again, but significantly closer, probably 50 feet in comparison to 100 feet before. And we had increased our speeds, so this alarmed us. We briskly walked around another bend, and as soon as we had come around it, we book it. 
It seemed to be a natural reaction on both our parts, as we started running without a word to initiate it. We're nearing the trailhead now, with only the hills to deal with. We catch our breaths for a moment, and I turn around again. I see the person seemingly halt in a sprint upon noticing me look back, as if they were trying to uphold the illusion that they were simply walking. At this point I shout, Go! And we sprint down the hill. What little light was left struggled to make its way through the dense trees surrounding us, and the steep hill proved challenging to run down without a clear path to be seen. We stumbled down the hill, almost falling multiple times and slamming our feet onto the rocks and loose brush. But we didn't fall, and we didn't look behind us. We make it to the bottom, but must continue up the initial hill, and then we would have made it out. We persevere up the incline, and make it back to our car. I briefly breathe in relief as I start my car. Heart pounding, and adrenaline racing as I reverse onto the road. The person emerges at the trailhead, apparently breathing heavily. We finally catch a glimpse of him. His hood had fallen off his head, exposing his pale complexion and dead eyes that were only illuminated by a single lantern at the start of the trail. He was holding something in his hand, but it was too dark to see, and I was not interested in sticking around to make out the object. I shift into drive and accelerate as fast as my car could muster leaving him behind in the dust of the empty side of the road. Night trail dude, let's not meet again. I saw an alien, no joke. To this day, I still wonder if I was somehow tripping on something I ate. I was about 10 years old, and was playing in my room by myself. It was about 11pm. I had a sliding glass door in my room, and the blinds were pulled back. Out of nowhere, the automatic spotlight behind my house turned on. I looked to the sliding glass door, and a figure started approaching the door. At first, I thought it was my neighbour, who was older than me, and about the same height. But as it got closer, I realised it was something else. I remember it approaching the door slowly. It stopped at the sliding glass door for a few seconds, and just started staring at me. It felt like an eternity passed by. Like, I remember specifically how long it felt, when in reality, it was probably only a few seconds. I remember it was dark black. It had a rounded head, just like you see in the movies, and was about six foot tall. Two arms, two legs, really skinny. The only thing is, that it was so close to me right on the other side of the glass, that there's no way I could have mistaken it for a human. I know what I saw. After a few seconds of staring at me, it just turned to the side and walked away. Long strides. It went out of view, and I immediately ran out of my room and screamed for my mum. She didn't believe me. I had to sleep in my room that night, knowing I had seen a legit alien a few feet away from me earlier. I'm now 23, and to this day I still get chills when I think about it. My eyes always start watering when I do think of it. I know it was not a dream. I know what I saw. But alas, no one believes me. The thing that creeps me out the most was its demeanour. I remember it coming slowly up to me and walking slowly away. That's what scares me the most. Like there's no rush. It was just watching me. I believe in aliens, but I don't really believe in aliens visiting Earth. 
so it's been quite hard to cope with. I think what I saw is what people call a grey. If anyone else has seen anything like it, I'd love to hear about it. On a 14-day canoe trip, we rolled up on this creepy abandoned fishing cabin. It was falling apart. We got out to explore and looked around. There were these ropes, or lines, hanging from tree to tree. And also there was a dead rotting moose on the dock. The cabin was empty, except for some shirts hanging up. And we began to realize it probably wasn't abandoned. There was a set of children's shoes in perfect condition, sitting outside on a picnic table or something like that. Same thing with a toothbrush. Fishing poles sitting upright and in good condition, when they would have been blown over easily in the winds. It was just a bunch of little things that pointed towards someone having been there recently. But it was all a lot creepier than it sounds. There was a constant feeling like someone was watching us, combined with just how run down and dilapidated the cabin was. I kept turning around as we paddled off, expecting to see someone hiding in the trees, watching us. I was in Denali National Park two years ago, with my now wife and two other friends. If you aren't familiar with it, it is a trailless wilderness. That means that there aren't trailheads or marked trails. And if you find social or game trails, you are encouraged to avoid them to keep the wilderness as pristine as possible. You give a backcountry permit to a unit, which is a large division of the park and has a limited number of campers in it. You get on the bus that goes to one of the roads through the park and drops you off when it is going through access to your assigned unit. Then it drives away and you're in the middle of nowhere. It is amazing and intimidating at the same time. Anyway, we backpack for two amazing days and have yet to see any wildlife other than the local ptarmigans. On the morning of the last night, the others are drinking coffee, and we are preparing to break camp. I'm looking down in the river valley that our campsite has a view of. We hadn't seen other humans for 48 hours, and I think I see some campers hiking through the brush in the distance. I call out, and the hikers turn out to be a bull moose who pops his head up and looks at us. We then start watching him, and he walks along the river and slowly makes his way towards our camp. He's not coming here, I say to the group. Well, he was. He climbed the hill and walked right into our campsite. We gave him a wide berth as he approached, as moose are the only animals you run from in Denali, as they can be aggressive. He froze and eyeballed us for a while then continued up the side of the mountain. It was scary as hell, but he was a majestic beast. Anyway, it starts pouring on us as we are finishing breaking camp, and we decide to save some time by following a game trail for a bit, as we were soaked and cold. This saved us a lot of time bushwhacking through alders and whatnot. Well, we round a corner, and the trail comes to a dead end, in what was the remains of a bear kill site. The bones of a moose, flattened down brush, old scat. Let me tell you, that's an unnerving feeling. We freeze, the blood drains out of our faces, and we look at each other and instantly agree to double back a bit and start our bushwhacking again to get out of Dodge. It was an epic trip, and I highly recommend it if you have any backpacking experience. If not, camp near the ranger station is also nice to do some day hikes.
my family moved from the Maryland mountains to West Palm Beach, Florida, when I was seven. Waterbeds were trendy at the time, so everyone in the house had one. On a few occasions, I would wake up to this odd smell in the air. I couldn't put my finger on how to describe it as a kid, so my folks didn't think much of it, and said it was the plastic waterbeds I was smelling. One night in particular sticks out in my mind, where I woke up to that weird odour, but there was someone with me. I thought it was my dad, because he told me he would be in to check on me. When I rolled over to look, I was caught completely off guard by snake people. Three of them. Their faces looked like a snake-human hybrid, and they had big, slitted eyes. I doubt they were more than three and a half feet tall, and they were watching me. I was frozen in fear staring back at them, while my waterbed sloshed from me rolling over. Next thing I know, it's morning, and I'm eating breakfast. Years later, my mother and I are out taking a walk. It looks like it's going to storm any minute, and there's a strong smell of ozone in the air. She looks at me and says, That's the same smell from when the aliens took you. And she tells me about when we first moved to Florida. Three little lizard men took me to a saucer in our yard. She wanted to stop them at first, but they convinced her I would be okay and wouldn't remember anything. So she went back to her bedroom and watched the saucer go into the sky from the window, leaving that strong ozone smell. After that, she went back to bed, and apparently never thought to tell me until I was 30. Now, every time I smell a storm coming, I get the willies. I had recently begun helping my mum sell my childhood home, and it sparked the memory of possibly the scariest thing that's happened to me. Me and my friends were 15. I grew up in a subdivision, about 20 minutes away from any towns. It was a very safe neighbourhood, street lights on the corners, lots of kids, lots of classmates lived there, and there was never any fear of us walking to each other's houses or staying out after dark. My subdivision was about three miles long, and I lived at the very end of it. The last mile is a sharp right turn into a hill and has thick woods along both sides of the street, with four houses at the bottom, all surrounded by woods. My friend Maddie lived at the entrance to the subdivision. One year, we got about eight inches of snow and ice. It shut down the roads, and people were stranded. Schools closed for a week. The first day of this snow, me, Maddie, and Kelly spent the whole day playing. We decided to have a big sleepover at Maddie's house that night. When the sun looked like it might start setting, we started the trek down to my house to get an overnight bag. By the time we'd finished packing, it was dark out. The woods always looked enchanting in the darkness, but it didn't bother us. The three of us start walking, joking, enjoying the night air, as we cleared the top of the hill. And then we saw something that made us stop in our tracks. A hooded figure, standing on the corner, illuminated only by the streetlights. They didn't move. They stood completely stiff, staring straight ahead. It was unsettling, but it easily could have been a neighbor. So with nervous laughs, we started descending the hill. The figure never moves, staring straight ahead. As we got to the bottom, we could see the hood was fur-lined, and they had some sort of black mask hiding their features. We began to get nervous. At this point, we're even with this person. It's dark now, and there's only one street lamp illuminating the corner. After staring at the figure for a solid 45 seconds, 
Maddie finally calls out, Hey, stop messing with us, it's not funny. At this point, the figure moved, only shuffling its feet to turn its body in our direction. They extended their hand towards us. Time stopped, and I could feel my heartbeat in my throat. The figure gestured, Come here, to us, before turning and walked into the woods. We ran as fast as our feet would take us, until we reached Maddie's house and deadbolted the door behind us. I stopped at the corner where the figure had been, and felt pure fear. There were two tracks of footprints, one leading out of the woods, and one leading back in. My husband and I recently moved out of Georgia, but before we left, we were staying at his parents' house. His parents' house is newly built, so it doesn't really seem like the type of place to be feeling like something is out of place. At his parents' house, they have cameras everywhere. They both are police officers. Like I said, it doesn't feel like the kind of place something would go wrong. Around three days before our move out of state, it was roughly around 9.30 at night, as I was using the restroom and craving a snack. So after I went into our bedroom where we were staying, which is a finished basement, I persuaded my husband into getting a snack with me. I walked out of the room first, but as I got to the door of our bedroom, I got the feeling like someone was behind it. So I slowly opened the door and looked behind it. Nothing was there, so I shrugged it off, closed the door, and continued into the kitchen. A few minutes later, my husband came into the kitchen and asked if I was hiding behind the door before he opened it. I told him no, but that I felt like someone was also behind the door as I opened it. I forgot to mention this earlier. His dad was on duty, and his mum was with one of his siblings at one of their football games. So essentially, we were alone. We both felt uneasy, but let it go. His siblings and his mum came home 15 to 20 minutes later, and we forgot about it. Fast forward to us living in our new apartment. I forgot to mention, but we have a dog, Alex who's a pointer, and we have a cat, Freya. And just a little insight by apartment. It's basically a townhouse. We have a garage and an upstairs. No one is below or under us. We've been living in the apartment for about four months, and every now and then, Alex will look up into the attic and slightly turn his head, and sometimes all the hairs on his back will stand up like no tomorrow and he will get in this defensive mode. Freya's eyes will go wide, and she'll creep around to wherever Alex is staring. Some may think this is completely normal for a hunting dog and a domestic cat, but not to me, as I'm the one who's been with them since birth, and have a little more knowledge on how they normally act. And since I do, I'll give my point of view on how they normally are. Alex. He's the sweetest, most gentle dog you'll ever meet. He loves Freya and small babies. He lets dogs rough him up at the park because he's just too gentle and will not fight back. Freya is laid back and doesn't care. She acts like a 20 year old cat, but barely a year old. Anyway, continuing on. The other day, my husband was in our home office and he thought I'd snuck up on him and was hovering over his shoulder. But when he turned around, I wasn't there, and he realised I was still at work. I just want to know what we've experienced, and what it could mean. My family camped in the same place every year. Awesome campsites. And it was surrounded by miles and miles of forest. Anyway. A couple of kilometers from the main area, we find this barbed wire fence. And being boys, 
we had to get over it. But at the time, it was far too tall. So we dug under it with my father's old tactical shovel. A fold-out shovel with a blade in one side. Anyway, we finally squeeze under, and we make our way into the forest. We walk for about 20 minutes, and when we don't see anything, we stumble upon a river. It was the middle of summer, and the river was running low. So we climb down the bank and decide to follow the river, because we had nothing better to do. We follow the river for a while, until we come across a strange sight. A very old, very rusty, Volkswagen Beetle, half buried in the bank, partially sunk into the riverbed. The front end was punched in, and the seats were ripped apart, and all the glass was missing. The weirdest thing was that there was this giant hole punched through the roof. The metal was bent outwards, like something had punched through from the inside of the car. The doors were rusted shut, but with our handy pocket knives and my dad's old tactical shovel, we ripped over the driver's side door. The other was sunk into the muck and inaccessible, and inside there was one leather shoe, still tied, just sitting there. It was super creepy, and thinking about it now, I'm pretty sure something very messed up happened. But as a kid, it was super cool and creepy. We never told anyone about it, and we returned to see it every year when we went camping, bringing our friends along and such. The last time we went to see the car, it was pretty much gone, totally sunken into the mud. The creepiest thing though, honestly, was that there were no roads for miles around, and it was all forest. Something I constantly pondered was how the hell it got into the riverbed in the first place, and where the hell the original driver went. I was about nine or ten. It was late at night, and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out, looking up at the sky, when I saw what looked like a UFO. It was a white orb rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles and shot away. It came back, and did the same thing, only it was closer and larger, and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out and walked from my room, around the corner, and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly, I heard someone coming up the stairs, and a snorting sound. I looked down, and all I saw was this tall, slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? But then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large black eyes, and got right up into my face, continuing to make that awful snorting sound. Kind of like a pig. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I just collapsed as it towered over me, and bent down, pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there, and I said that I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face, and that snorting sound. And I think I'll die of a heart attack, if I ever see it again. About three months ago, my wife, then fiance and I, were driving from Oregon to Arizona. We were in a part of Nevada that was in the middle 
of nowhere. We were on the end of a 70 mile stretch, with no cell service at midnight. My wife is a small girl, only five foot one and a hundred pounds. I often joke when I go to see her at work, oh, it must be take your child to work day. She's that small. It was my wife's turn to drive at this point. So I was reclined in my seat, out of view, sleeping. She shakes me awake and says, this guy's been following me on my ass for a while. I don't know what his issue is. I glance behind to see a big F-350, only about 10 feet behind us. I tell her to speed up, figuring he was just wanting us to go faster, but he keeps the same distance from us at all times. All of a sudden, he shoots into the oncoming lane, overtakes us, and then proceeds to slow in front of us, bringing his and our speed to only 10 miles an hour. She backs off a considerable distance when he slams on his brakes and starts opening his door. At this point, I sit up all the way. I am a pretty big guy and I roll my window down. When he spots me, he slams his door shut and takes off. I'm not one to jump to conclusions, but I feel that the guy didn't see me. He would have definitely tried to take my wife. It shook us up pretty badly. And at the next gas station, we found the attendant and called it in. Luckily, I got his plate numbers. And that's why you don't drive in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. You never know who is out there. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight, if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time, I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette, moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird. I am an au pair in Sweden, and spend most of my summer weekends in my family's summer house, which is out in the archipelago outside of Stockholm. Breathtakingly beautiful place, but boonies don't even begin to cover it. The nearest neighbour is about a 30 minute brisk walk away, and after that, there's nothing except ocean and thick terrifying forest. This particular night was date night for my parents, so I was left with the two children alone out in the terrifying murder house. There are two houses on the property, one main house 
and the other is a guest house, where of course I got to sleep all alone. It's literally two meters from the ocean. The game plan was to go exploring in the forest, which I had never done alone with the children, only with the parents, and then walk to pick up my boyfriend from the bus stop. He would stay with us until our parents got home from their date, and then my boyfriend and I would go to sleep in the guest house. So while in the house, I kept getting the jitters. Things were definitely stranger, and it wasn't just because I was alone with two children. I grew up in the forest, but several times we heard the birds calling out these weird distress call noises, and big flocks would appear. A long time before we were even close enough to scare them. And there were big, thudding footsteps nearby. I was terrified of there being a big moose or something. We came to a little hidden lake. And then things got even weirder. Though the place is unpopulated for miles, there was a woman sitting on a rock opposite us, about 60 feet away. She was naked and wet, as though she had been swimming, even though the water was much too cold for that. When she saw us, she stood up and did this weird pacing thing like she would get too close to the water and then back away, then move close again, like she wanted to cross and come towards us, but there was the obvious lake barrier in the way. The kids were mildly worried, and it wasn't before long that I ushered them back the way we'd came, in order for us to make our way out of the forest. On the road to pick up my boyfriend, I had the oddest sensation of being watched. I was really terrified, actually. But we met him with no incident and returned to the cabin just as the sun was setting. We gave the kids dinner, and just as they were curling up with the Swedish comic book, the main door slammed open. I remember thinking it was a real person, there was a heavy footfall, and then bam, like someone had stomped and flung open the door. But there was no one there. My boyfriend went out and had a look around. Nothing. It must have been the wind, of course. Right? It's always the wind. While we were in bed reading the story, we could hear skittering around and clawing from underneath where we were. I knew for a fact that rats and other rodents camped out at the other end of the house, because that's where the kitchen was, but whatever. I had a really awful feeling in the pit of my stomach, but my rational boyfriend promised me it was a fox or weasel, and not to get worked up. Fast forward to 3am, I had to pee. My boyfriend and I were in the guest house. My bosses had come home long ago. I'm a badass and pee outside with no problems. So I stumbled out of the darkness and squatted down outside the guest house to pee. And it was right after, when I straightened up and adjusted my shirt, that I got that awful feeling of dread. It was the same one I had in the forest. The one I had when I was on my way to see my boyfriend. I had it while we were camped out inside the house. I had felt just fine in the guest house with my boyfriend, but now that feeling was back. Behind the guest house is a steep hill at about a 45 degree angle, and on that hill sits what we call the ghost house. It was the house of an old soldier in the 1600s, and now it just sits there all terrifying and vacant. There's a trail going from the ghost house to the main summer home, and my boss had lit the trail with dim, useless solar lamps. You wouldn't be able to read by the light of the lamps, 
but the idea was to light your way up the hill and not trip and die over a tree root or something. I could sense a presence moving up the trail. That means something moving from the main house to the ghost house. I squinted in the dark and saw a shape of a person, but that wasn't right, because by the solar light you can see colour, jeans or a shirt or jacket, and ours all had reflectors on them, but this was just a black shadow. I thought, an animal perhaps, but then ruled it out as it walked on two legs, walking really fast and smoothly, but then it slowed and seemed to notice me. I was actually terrified. Good thing I had just peed, right? But then my intuition told me to commence stare down, and so I did. I was fighting to see in the dark, and just when I couldn't focus, I realized there were two very softly illuminated eyes on its face, and they were on me. It slowed down to a stroll, and I could see the eyes changing tint from a bluish to a yellowish glow based on what they were in relation to the solar lamps. They were catching light. So I started. It was going so slow now that this felt surreal, and I could hear twigs snapping and other noises that a real-life, non-imagined creature makes. I remember actually thinking, this isn't a hallucination. It's walking on the ground. And then the weirdest part. Instead of moving at a normal, relative height, the way human eyes or animal eyes would, the eyes start kind of hovering. They were six feet off the ground, suddenly would dip down to four feet, then back up to five, and they never left me. But the direction this thing was moving in never changed. It kept going up the hill. The eyes and the figure faded out into the darkness once the solar lamps ended, and I went back into the guest house and locked the door. I heard nothing else that night. My boyfriend slept through everything, but early in the morning he woke up whimpering from a nightmare. And that's the only time anything has ever happened at that summer house, and I was there collectively for a month. I was doing a long hike from Springer Mountain to Fontana Dam that's about 165 miles. I was a little behind schedule on day three, where I had planned to take a near zero day and spend some time at mountain crossings. Initially, I was going to spend night two in the hostel there but a big storm prevented me from crossing Bloody Mountain the day before. As a result, I had to revamp my plan and add about seven miles to my day. So after a soda and a burger at Mountain Crossing, I hit the trail again. I came to a road crossing, and there's this guy with an old 80s style external frame pack taking a break. Being me, I stopped pulled out a cliff bar and a smoke, and decided to have a conversation for a bit. I could use the break anyway. We talked for a bit, and I alluded to which shelter I was heading to. Do not do this if you don't trust the person. That was my first mistake. The guy seemed a little odd, but this was the Appalachian Trail. Everyone is weird. At that point, we're all walking to Maine. We started talking about 1pm. He had started his day at Neil's Gap, and I started on the other side of Blood Mountain. We'd started at roughly the same time, and I had taken a two hour break. My pace easily put me ahead of this guy by seven or eight miles. The shelter I had alluded to was actually out of his range, or so I thought. There were also three shelters between us and my final destination. We parted ways and I kept on trucking. 
I get to camp and do my usual thing. I made good time, so I actually had quite a bit of downtime before hike at midnight, which is 8pm. Several hours had passed, and I had peppered for the night, and was reworking my plan while talking to the other hikers, and this guy rolls into camp, looking like he had just gone on the Bataan Death March. He trucked it up to try and catch me up. The guy started to show his true colours in camp. He was really loud and obnoxious, and would not leave me alone. I decided that night I would carry a bit of extra water and do breakfast outside of camp to try and distance myself away from him. The next morning, I was up just before sunrise. I packed and hit the trail. Then, two miles later, I tweaked my knee on some rock crossing. Ugh. That did it. I needed to get some rest and ice on this thing. I go to the gap where you can either hitch west into Hiawisi, where most people go, or hitch east into Helen. I decided to go into Helen as I figured I'd also take advantage of the Bavarian atmosphere that the town provides. Lo and behold, a few hours later this same guy comes rolling into my hotel. I found out later he had asked some southbounders about me, and figured out where I'd gone. Holy crap. Now this is creepy. I had to get him away from me. I figured, while in town, I'd kill him with kindness. So I got some beers and made some more conversation. We were talking about our plans, and I knew this was my chance. I told him that because of my knee, I was probably going to take the next day off as well, and continue on after that. He said he'd join me, just like I expected. I said cool, and went to my room. As soon as I got to my room, I packed up and set my alarm for 4.30am. I phoned the owner of the hotel to make sure she could give me a ride to the trail that early. The next morning, I quietly grabbed my gear and hopped into her car. We headed the few miles up the road to the trailhead, and I basically started running. I never saw the guy again, but I heard stories about him up the trail. That was a hell of a trip. I had a bear bed down within arm's reach of me in my tent. That's a story for another day though. I haven't done a long hike in a few years. Telling these stories really does make me want to get back into the trail. Perhaps I will. In summer. I found some cheap train tickets to Luxembourg, and being the adventurous person I am, decided to book last minute and go all by myself. Due to some unfortunate and lack of planning circumstances, I ended up on that train to Luxembourg with nothing to wear for the weekend except the clothes on my back. I figured it was no big deal. How boring would it have been for everything to have gone according to plan? Anyway, Luxembourg City is quite small, and after two days I had pretty much seen most of what I wanted to see. A quick Google search showed me that there was a beautiful forest some kilometres north of the city. I thought it looked perfect, so I bought a day train pass and set out on my journey. I managed to make it there, and it was gorgeous. I wasn't really dressed for hiking since I had no clothes or shoes with me at the time, but didn't want to miss out on such an amazing experience. So I ventured into the forest anyway. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and ballet flats for shoes. I told myself I'd stay close to the area, and not do any crazy rock climbing or anything, and nothing would go wrong. Boy, was that a dumb assumption to make. I was about 45 minutes away from where I started walking. There was no one else around, and I walk along a sharp turn, and there's a lady walking towards me. She was probably 45 or so, and seemed quite plain. As we approached each other, she suddenly says, That's not okay. I ignore this as I tried to ignore people on the street as much as possible, and continue walking. She has reached the point of being right next to me now, 
and as she passes, she says, You can't do this. There's no one else around. So she has to be talking to me. I reluctantly turn towards her and ask, Pardon me? She says, How dare you show up here like this? I think she has me confused for someone else. I offer her an apology and continue, but she follows. Don't you understand? You're ruining it. I say nothing. What the hell am I supposed to say? I see some big branches close by that I could perhaps use as a weapon if I need to. I don't even know what's going on at this point. She's screaming now, repeating it's all sacred and my shoes are ruining the sacredness of the forest. I stand my ground, offer one more apology, and she tells me I'm going to regret it. I don't know why, but I told her that I had nothing else to wear, trying to justify myself, I suppose. Then she tells me it doesn't matter. I'm starting to feel relieved. Maybe she'll leave me alone. The forest is protected. Do you know who protects it? She says. No. Realistically, where can I run? Nowhere. Who can I call? No one. So I have to face this lady at all times. I don't want her attacking me from behind or something. She proceeds to tell me that Jesus Christ is protecting the forest. I nod. Sounds about right. She repeats that it doesn't matter to her anymore that I'm wearing ballet flats. She then says that Jesus and God know, since she told them. She tells me that God will not let me leave the forest. Pardon? And she tells me slowly that God knows I have forsaken the forest and that I am a traitor and a sinner. She tells me that I'm not going to make it out and that I will never leave. God will never let me. That he sees me here, ruining the sacredness of the forest. And he sent her to find me. That I had my chance. And that he will dish out the punishment that I deserve. I nod. I'm kind of scared, but at least she has left it up to God to punish me. So I should be safe. I just need her to walk away. We hold eye contact for a long 45 seconds, and then she turns and carries on. I stay where I am, slowly back up into a tree, and wait while I watch her leave. I was afraid she had some nearby friends, so I wanted my back up against something to make me feel safer. She was still within earshot when I heard her say, He won't let you leave. You know nothing you can do can change that. She kept walking and never turned back. I waited 15 minutes with my back to that tree, then slowly kept going and never saw her again. Religious fanatic in the Mullethal Forest? Let's not meet again. I was about nine or ten. It was late at night, and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out looking up at the sky, when I saw what appeared to be an unidentified flying object. It was a white orb, rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles, then shot away. It came back and did the same thing, only it was closer and larger and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out and walked from my room around the corner and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly I heard someone coming up the stairs and a snorting sound. I looked down and saw this tall, slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? But then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large, black eyes, and got right up into my face continuing to make that awful snorting sound. 
kind of like the sound a pig makes. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I just collapsed as it towered over me and bent down, pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there, and I said I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face, and that snorting sound. I think I'll die of a heart attack, if I ever see it again. I was in Ruidoso, New Mexico, about 12,000 feet elevated, just staring at the stars outside my home. I can get lost in the stars for hours. It was about midnight, and I noticed a green glow coming from deep in the forest. Mind you, everything is dark, and everybody is sleeping up here. It would pulsate on and off again. I wanted to check it out, but didn't dare in the night. Must have been at least 20 to 30 yards away. Then time passes, and I see some lights dancing in the sky, moving up and down the side. I started to put my focus on that, then went on for over an hour. They started low, and slowly made their way higher. Well, this part, mind you, scared the hell out of me. Out of nowhere, it pulsated a lime green colour. So strong, I could make out it's an aircraft of some kind. Not your typical aircraft, but an oval one, with windows running all around it. It was like the sides were all glass. The crazy thing is, the green glow was the same one I'd seen earlier in the forest. Some time passes, and I'm just sitting there taking it all in, hoping no bear or wild animal comes and attacks me in the night. And above me I see this huge craft. I had my camera on me, ready to take pictures of whatever. But in that moment, I felt like I froze and couldn't move. I'd never seen this craft as well. First, it was all black, apart from the red circle-shaped lights on the back. It must have been about four to five lights. Second, it was moving slow, like hovering at slow speeds. Lastly, it was shaped like a triangle. No lie. It was way too low for an aircraft. And, above me, I was shitting bricks. I couldn't even call my folks while I was in awe of whatever it was. I know this sounds highly unlikely, but I wouldn't waste my time sharing this just for the hell of it. This happened 10 years ago. It could have been military, or an exotic aircraft that they're creating, but I really don't know. Nonetheless, I was amazed and terrified seeing it. My husband and I are amateur mushroom hunters. Three seasons out of the year, we spend weekends in forests, along nature trails and rivers, looking for edible and interesting wild mushrooms to harvest. Springtime brings the most exciting hunt, which is for the highly coveted morels. We know of a special stretch of shoreline along the river that has a few dozen morels each year. It's difficult to get to, as it's off the proper path, and you have to do quite a bit of ducking, climbing, and maneuvering to get to it. One day, two years ago, we were doing just that, making our way slowly and searching carefully for the mushrooms hiding in plain sight. We were so preoccupied with our task that we did not know how long we were being watched or followed. But at one point, we saw a man up ahead of us, looking at us and not saying anything or moving almost like he was waiting to be noticed. My husband saw him first and turned to shoot me a look, because we never encountered anyone in that spot before. It was besides a small and fairly busy park, but people didn't stray from the paved paths much. There was a weird energy about the man, 
that can be best described as vaguely menacing. We were near the end of where we wanted to look. Anyway, so we turned around and started walking our way back. When we looked behind us a few moments later, the man was gone. We wrote it off as just some weirdo, perhaps a homeless guy whose territory had been wandered into. We continued looking over the spots we had already covered in case we'd missed any morels, with me in front and my husband right behind me. Looking back every few places, as we were feeling more paranoid as we went along. All of a sudden, I look up from the ground at my feet and the man is blocking our path about 30 feet ahead. He had to have taken the riverbank and crept up alongside us on the path in order to get ahead of us, so that he could cut us off the way he had. I whipped around with huge eyes at my husband, who looks over my shoulder, sees him, and starts to move up the hill on our right as the riverbed was to our left, grabbing my hand to pull me with him. Adrenaline shot us out of the thick brush and onto the paved path in the open park. Without speaking, we broke into a sprint towards the direction of our car several blocks away. When we were far enough away from the riverbank to risk a backwards glance, we saw the man emerge from the brush. He just stood there watching us leave, motionless. We speculated the entire ride home what he wanted from us, knowing it was nothing innocent. To this day, it still bothers me, and I wonder what would have happened if we had been spread apart further while we hunted, or if either of us had been alone. I don't think I want to find out. <laughs>